give pleasure to his devotees and to uplift the devotees by his association. Arjun, being such a close, intimate association, associate of the Lord, he's, um, he's so intimately connected with the Lord. They would eat together. They'd sleep on the same bed together. They would sit around and talk, friendly, friendly talks together. And uh, of course, Arjuna always knew his position as the Lord's servant. But the intimacy of friendship was very strong. And therefore, feeling separation from the Lord, he wanted to see the Lord, to find out what was the Lord's next program of work. A devotee always wants to know what is the Lord doing now. I remember that same principle usually used to apply to us when Srila Prabhupada was here. What is Srila Prabhupada doing now? Where is he going? What is he saying? What books are he translating? So we would hang on to every uh, message that we could get about Srila Prabhupada's activities. And when we would hear something, sometimes Prabhupada would send a letter and would come to one devotee and then he would announce Prabhupada has sent a letter and all the devotees would eagerly come around like bees around a flower for the honey. And they'd all sit as the devotee would read the letters. Sometimes they would read the letter a couple times just to relish the words of Srila Prabhupada more and more. So this attraction and attachment to the Supreme Lord or to his pure devotee, the spiritual master, is the ticket back home, back to Godhead. And so Arjun, he has that deep connection with the Lord. He is, he is already an eternal associate of the Lord, as is mentioned here. But still, he wants to be with the Lord even in the material world when the Lord is performing his pastimes. So that's the nature of a Vaishnava there. And they want to hear more about the Lord. They want to know what the Lord is doing. They want to come and meet the spiritual master, associate with the spiritual master, hear the words of the spiritual master. And these things are what we call nectar for the for the devotees, and like they become like bees, just seeking that nectar. So we'll go on to the next verse. Yatita kati chin mansas tadayadya tato junaha dardasa gura rupani nimatani kuru dvabaha. A, full, a few months passed and Arjun did not return. Maharaj Yudhisthir then began to observe some auspicious omens, which were fearful in themselves. Report. Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is ad infinitum, more powerful than the more, most powerful son of our experience. Millions and billions of suns are created by him and annihilated by him within his one breathing period. In the material world, the sun is considered to be the source of all productivity and material energy. And only due to the sun can we have the necessities of life. Therefore, during the personal presence of the Lord on the earth, all paraphernalia for our peace and prosperity especially religion and knowledge, were in full display because of the Lord's presence, just as there is a flood of light in the presence of the glowing sun. Maharaj Yudhisthira observed some discrepancies in his kingdom and therefore became very anxious about Arjun, who was long absent, and there was also no news about Dwarka's well-being. He, he suspected the disappearance of Lord Krishna otherwise, there would have no, been no possibility of fearful omens. Hmm. So we hear, we also, we were reading in our delineation of the 12th canto, chapter 2, and when the Lord's footprints are present on the earth, 
Kali cannot do anything. Kali is paralyzed by the presence of the Lord. But when the Lord leaves, then Kali can start doing his nonsense, spreading his evil omen, even evil activities everywhere. So now uh, Yudhisthir is noticing why are these omens there? Why is there some discrepancy when the Lord is personally present and his devotees are following him? Then everything is auspicious. There is no calamities. There's no lack. There is no deficiencies, even in, in, in nature's cycles. Nature provides everything. The rains come in according to the time they are meant to come. Everything is nicely arranged by nature when God is on the planet. When he leaves, and then he, uh, then all of the, then Kali Yuga rushes in full force. And that's, we've heard that so many times. And we see now, since Krishna left the planet about 5,138 years ago, uh, Kali Yuga has only increased. Of course, Kali, Kali would be even more effective if it wasn't for the presence of the devotees, and especially the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So it's Kali Kalai Nama Rupa Krishna Avatar Nama Hoyte Haya Sarva Jagat Mr. So that the appearance of the Lord in this age is in his holy name. It is an incarnation of the Lord. It is non-different than the Lord. Nama Chintamani Krishna Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purnya Sudya Nitya Mukta Binatvam Nami Nami no. So, Abhinna means non-different. And the name, and the he who is named, as explained in that verse, Nami and Nama are the same. There's no difference. So the Supreme Personality of Godhead has descended in the form of the chanting of his holy name in this age, Harinam Sankirtan. Golokira, Premadana, Harinam Sankirtan, Ratin Jan Milo Kene Upai. There's no difference. This, this Harinam Sankirtan has come from the spiritual world. So Krishna is personally present in the lives of his devotees who chant the holy names of the Lord and those who spread the holy names affect the entire <clears throat> created atmosphere. And even Mother Nature benefits us by the chanting of the holy name. Mm -hmm. We have many stories where, not by purpose, but by situation, the chanting of the holy name has brought auspiciousness in the environment and has destroyed people's sicknesses, it has destroyed diseases. It has brought about a regulated re weather when irregular weather was very strong. So these things are just byproducts of the Holy Name's appearance, which is the real benefit is that everyone becomes purified from all sinful activities and uh, develops the adhikari or the, or the qualities of again associating with Krishna in the spiritual world. So here we see that according, just like the world today is quite sinful, the demons are in control and they're, they're in every area of society's control. control. They're in the entertainment area, they're in the political area, in the social area, medical area. Uh, um, ecological area, the demons have influence everywhere. So therefore, there are so many problems in the world. But it would be much worse if it wasn't for the chanting of the holy name. If the holy name, if the chanting of the holy name increases worldwide, then Kali Yuga will also start to decrease in its effect. You know, this will usher in Lord Chaitanya's golden age, which is predicted in this age. So we are in the midst of this uh, great historical period. 
to make a difference in bringing about uh, pure uh, spiritual principles on earth. And Mother Earth is always suffering because of the effects of the demons of uh, sinful activity. She is also a, a living entity, very powerful in the entity personification of Mother Earth. She's called Bhumi, Bhumi Devi. And she is a devotee of the Lord. And she's also the principal energy for punishing the living entities in this world when they become sinful and rewarding the pious and devotional devotees in the, in the world when they follow religious principles and devotional service. And she's very intimately con connected. So here, um, Yudhisthira is seeing that on earth there are so many omens. He knows something is wrong. He is suspecting that Krishna has to disappear. And as this chapter goes on, you'll see some of the dialogue that sort of brings about the actual reality, that dialogue between him and Arjun. So this is uh, very interesting here. Um, just like Prabhupada sometimes said, when places in the world have severe cold or severe heat, the people also are uh, under tribulations because of these things. It's an indication that that area of the world is more sinful. Just like when Prabhupada was in London, he was on one talk show. And uh, the the, uh, the moderator, the disc jockey, he was very uppity type of guy. He liked to uh, challenge his guests. So he said a, some, somewhat of a facetious statement saying, Swamiji, can you tell us what is your definition of hell? And Prabhupada responded, London. <laughs> Everybody was shocked. And then Prabhupada went on to say, Yes, London, it's always cold, and dark, and damp. <laughs> it's rainy all the time. The sun, if the sun comes out, it's very rare. <laughs> and then he went on to, you know, after everybody's like with long faces, as Prabhupada is, and Prabhupada went on to say, But in India, the sun shines every day because it's a land of Dharma, it's a land of piety. And so you don't see such severe weather conditions. Everything works according to the seasons, generally. And so the next day in the London Tribune, there was a statement right on the front page of the paper. Um, Swami, uh, Bhaktivedanta Swami calls London hell. <laughs> big letters so yeah and so there's hellish places around the world <laughs> due to the sinful life of people people don't understand that the sinful activities affects themselves people around them and the environment they think whatever they do is just happening to them but they don't understand but everyone has influence. Prabhupada would talk about that. We all have influence, each and every one of us. So if we are Krishna consciousness, we are spreading that influence to others and to the environment also. If we are, whatever influence we have, we also reflect that in the lives of others and in the environment around us. If you're peaceful by nature, you'll attract peaceful people to you. If you have a tendency to get angry, you'll see that people who are angry somehow come into your jurisdiction. If you're lusty, always looking for some fulfillment of your lusty desires, then you will see so many opportunities for that to happen. 
if you're chasing after money, then you will find so many opportunities to make money. The energy you uh, maintain is the energy you put out and also the energy you bring back. Mm -hmm. Just like Pallad Ananda Maharaj. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry. Pallad Maharaj. <laughs> Pallad Maharaj said, uh, I see the whole world is happy. Now, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, the quality on the Sasnatham, this place is miserable, full of his temper and his miserable. He's seeing the whole world is happy. Why? Because he's seen Krishna everywhere. And he see, he, because he's feeling happy, his vision is everything around him is, appears in the same way. And so we see that also. If we are miserable, we, we look at other people and they look also miserable. <laughs> if we're happy, we attract happy people to us. So, so your consciousness is a reflection of your life and how you live your, develop your consciousness is how you will live your life. Okay, so here we're seeing a little bit about the suspected disappearance of Lord Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Marsha, for such a nice class. Actually, as, as you were mentioning few uh, really few major points i was uh, reflecting on some points that i've heard many years ago and uh, thank you for bringing it up and especially for me reminding me how important it is that we got to uh, correct our consciousness that was a very nice point thank you marge i'm going to stop sharing so that we can all go uh, get to the gallery stage and that way um, everyone can um, whoever is a, you know able to please do turn on your video and please do ask a question. If you have any questions from this really two amazing classes, the disciplines of Lord Krishna and Maharaj gave very nice examples. Uh, please do raise your hand because we have a list and I don't want to miss anybody. So um, if you have a question, please raise your hand or you can put in the post and I will read it. Maharaj, I, will, I have a question and that is about, it, it, in the first verse, you touched uh, uh, on relationships between Arjuna and Krishna. And sometimes um, what's coming to my mind, Maharaj, is I, you also said that Arjuna knew his position. Um, wait, what did I just do? I think I did something. Oh, sorry. Um, that Arjuna knew his position, but at the same time, they had a very intimate relationship. So amongst devotees, Maharaj, how can we um, maintain a very healthy, loving relationship but without crossing the familiarity breeds contempt stage. Yeah, well, if you always think when you're in association of devotees, how to please the devotees by your words, by your activities, by your presence. Yeah, I accidentally ran into two people I knew today just by just by being in a certain place and I didn't expect to see either one of them. So all of a sudden I'm thinking, what can I do to, you know, act in a way that will be create a pleasurable relationship, a pleasurable experience, pleasurable exchange. So we, we think like that. As soon as we meet somebody, what can we do to, it may be even small, some friendly words, some questions about the person's well-being, or something. And if you think of something you can do, to serve that person, then do it. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Thank you. Any questions from Devore Sri Devi? I see you thinking very deeply. <laughs> so, 
Any questions from devotees? Any thoughts that come into your mind? Marja, and, and another point that you mentioned um, that immediately uh, took me back years ago because I heard the same statement from His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami where you said uh, in the second verse that um, who, uh, how he put it was uh, is who you are is who you attract. What you are is who you attract in terms of consciousness. <laughs> And March, we know, like, you know, many of us, well, I'll speak for myself, you know, when I joined the movement, I was not in the mode of goodness, or I, I was not like, so pukka, you know, mlecha, chandala, whatever you want to call it, March. Over a course of time, Maraj, you know, how can we change our consciousness, or how can we recognize to that the need to change our consciousness, because that is how, by changing it, we know who we attract. I, I don't know if I'm making sense yeah. here. This is Hare Krishna. That <laughs> changes your consciousness. <laughs> you become Krishna conscious. <laughs> but Marj, sometimes there are situations that oh, I've come across yeah. where... I'm sorry, Marj. Yeah, it's not an oversimplification of the answer. It's actually the... Yeah, we, we, we can Hare Krishna, we'll be Krishna conscious. For Krishna conscious, then we're in the best consciousness. And in March, I've I've come across situations where sometimes people, you know, it, and 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 I've seen it in, in the devotee society where, you know, we try to help each other to raise our consciousness, you know, as as we say, but at the same time, there is the interest of coming to the lower consciences of gossip. How can we come out of that, Maharaj? When you recognize it, don't do it. <laughs> when mm. you see it moving in that area, just try to divert it away from that. Uh, well, if we have a, a tendency towards it, we might just fall into it. But if, we're, if, we're, if we don't want to do it, and then we recognize it's happening by the other person's, you know, words or by just by the other person's presence i just change it and the internet is gossip facebook is disgraced book <laughs> instagram means instant apparat <laughs> You know, it's just like the, what else? Is, Twitter means, uh, you know, pick somebody's line. Mm -hmm. It's just all of these these social networks have become, uh, you know, places of crows. Marcia, I remember hearing a class a few months ago. I don't know who said it, where someone said that Facebook is actually fake book. Yeah. I think it was Sri Devi's class, if I'm not mistaken, a few months ago, because people post the good times in their lives, but not the struggles of their life. <laughs> it's always the happy moments, and it gives a very uh, uh, illusory, you know, message that all oh, my life is very good. It's it's, it's false ego book. That's all. <laughs> you want to know? Tell people how who you are and how nice you are. <laughs> yes, Mother Sri Devi, go ahead. Thank you, Anasya. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance for glories to Srila Prabhupada. Just now, Maharaj, you said that you know when we meet people, we can just in response to Anasya's question of how to maintain healthy, loving connections with one another that we just try to be uh, nice, cordial, have some nice exchanges, change, exchange some Krishna Katha, something nice, uplift each other, and then go on our way. But what do we do when devotees come up to you and the first thing out of their mouth is something negative? People are coming these days to the temple. Oh, no one is coming to you. You've started your practice, but no one is coming, you know? You know, things like that. <laughs> I'm like, I want to respond when the first thing out of their mouth is something negative. 
I said, no, I mean, it's not so bad and something like that. And I just uh, try to make it more on a more positive note. So Dr. Tita Maharaj said, treat every person you encounter as if the success of the spirit of your spiritual life depends on the quality of your interaction with that person. So even if they are being negative, uh, it's our duty to try to move it towards the positive, right? Is that correct? Huh? Goranga, Goranga. <laughs> Goranga. <Nityananda. laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. Understood. Goranga. Jai Raj. <laughs> Thank you, Sri Devi. Thank you. Yes, Raj Prabhu, please go ahead with your question. Okay, thank you, Mataji. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Maharaj. All glories to all of the devotees. Maharaj, I was, I was thinking when you were talking about <clears throat> the uh, the time that Krishna was leaving the planet in that in that particular form, and there were bad omens, <clears throat> and there was inauspiciousness and darkness. And I was thinking how this very closely relates to when we allow, when we allow the material energy to to overcome us, and we push out, we push out Krishna from our minds and our hearts, and that also creates inauspicious and omens and darkness not only in our minds but in our hearts and our consciousness and also in the people around us in an environment around us so it is so so important for us to recognize that and then even if we're in entering a, another environment which may not be so pleasant or Krishna conscious at least we can try and inject some Krishna consciousness into that environment. Yeah, or at least keep the relationship pleasant. What is it? <clears throat> Sally Kapanda says there are three things that are in this world that are are valuable food water soft speech hmm. march i had a thing about that soft speech for a while but i'll let brush Prabhu finish <laughs> No, please carry on, Master. Mara's soft speech is unheard of in today's language. I'm sure, I mean, definitely, you know, we can definitely see it more in the devotee community, but sometimes that can become a little bit hard. How can we really develop or help? Or I, I think, Marge, sometimes I see situations where, you know, we ourselves are not aware that we are not soft. And I think it's the whole awareness, you know, trying to be aware of our actions. How can we be aware? Of, and I think it goes back to your, to your topic of consciousness. How can we be aware? How we are speaking, is it palatable? The words we choose, is it palatable? You know, even if it's a confrontational situation, how can we think, you know, and really, you know, put the words? It just becomes like, you know, darts and arrows <laughs> shooting out. How can we develop that awareness of soft, soft speech, Maharaj? When you, you when you know it's it's the way to communicate. In other words, it's more it's something that is easy, more listenable than somebody who is brash or 
uh, when we say, what's the word? Uh, just speaking without thinking. Mm -hmm. So, Marge, does that mean that we have to develop to be good listeners? Well, being a good listener is the foundation for the you know, proper response and clear response. Listening means not only to hear the words, but to hear how the words are being delivered. You can even, even if somebody writes something in the mood of humility, you can pick it up in that same way. If someone writes something in the mood of accusing, accusing even if they use nice words, still you can pick up the mood. It's almost even reflected in writing too. Those words have a, a power to them beyond just what the, the word means. They reflect the consciousness of the person. So if you're trying to make a point, you speak in a certain way. If you're trying to, to understand things, you respond in a certain way. But hearing, as you mentioned, listening is the foundation by which your response will be in the best possible way. Thank you, Marge. I'll let Raj Prabhu go. I'm sorry for jumping in, Prabhu, but your question was so nice. I apologize. No, no, no I was actually reddishing. I was relishing that conversation very, very much. And I was thinking about what Guru Maharaj had been saying about hearing previously, and how, how hearing is the key to actually our understanding Shastra and realizing the Shastra and speak, seeing through the eyes of Shastra, and therefore also being able to respond through the knowledge of Shastra. And you know, so hearing will actually help from all angles. Sometimes you have to speak strongly mm -hmm. a situation, and there's an art to do that. I know this one uh, sannyasi, he's really good at it. He can pretty much tell you you're a first-class fool in a very nice way. And it becomes very receptive because the way he says it. <laughs> Prabhupada could tell you the same thing, but Prabhupada's ability to do it was his purity. Because he had no ego, he had no motivation for doing it other than to deliver a message to you. But if you, someone on the street responds to you in a negative way, you're going to feel offended. Or if somebody you don't know starts telling you what to do, you immediately shut down. So there's a lot of dynamics because the whole basis of life is relationship and communication is the basis of relationship. So relationships break down or build up by the, by the type of understanding of, of how to deal in that relationship in such a way as to further the quality of the relationship rather than destroy the quality of the relationship. Thank you, Maharaj. <clears throat> Maharaj, why is it then that I hear what you're saying, that if somebody insults you or, or abuses you, then you would, you would not feel happy about that. But when they do that and you're in your out on book distribution, you're not bothered about it. Right. Because you expect it. 
Okay. Okay, that's the difference. You, know, you, you don't never know what, what kind of response you're going to get out there. But if somebody does that, you can think two ways. Boy, what a what a nonsense guy. He's so stupid. He doesn't know what he's doing. Or you could say, well, you know, he's um, he, he's probably having a rough life, so he's just expressing his anxiety whenever the opportunity comes out. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, so the scriptures say, one should speak truthfully and beneficially avoid speech that offends and quote the, quote the Shastras regularly to back up what you're saying. That's in more or less in a discussion on philosophy, but it's also the same principles apply. Learning how to uh, use examples in a way to teach people is very good. Just like Anarada Muni wanted to teach King Prachina Barhishat. But he couldn't teach him directly by explaining what he wanted to say to him, because he knew the king would either be offended or not accepted. So he created a fictitious character, which was the same person he was talking to. And then he said things about that character in a very analogous way, and in order to make the message. So sometimes just if you want to teach someone, you want to instruct someone or correct someone, you might use an example of another person as a way to give that same instruction to the person you're talking to. So once you, there is an art to speaking. I haven't learned it really good yet. I'm too passionate. But there are there is an art to speaking that somehow or other. Um, as a way of uh, communicating what you want to say. One of the things that is really good about speech is learn how to speak to what you're talking about. One thing that I see people do when you ask them something and the answer is simple. It's either a yes or no answer with a few words along. They give you a, a long, long explanation of their answer. You know, it's almost like they wrote a book right there. <laughs> well, I asked one person, you know, um, can you do this? And they say, well, no, I can't do this because I had to go over there. I, I, I saw this other person. I met this other person. And we went down this. And so I didn't have time to do what you wanted me to do. But I'll do it in another time when I have more time. And, uh, you know, so they go on and on with a long diatribe trap about. And then you think, I got the answer already. Just shut up, you know. <laughs> I don't say that, but you know, you you, you want to. That's what you want to say. Okay. So when you say soft speech, does that mean that you mean uh, it should be pleasing, truthful, and beneficial? Well, yeah. Stick to the subject matter. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you're talking to people, they change the subject to something that is completely irrelevant. Oh, I see. Okay. So pleasing, truthful, beneficial, and to the point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marge. I could definitely relate to that. Points that there's a, there's a general psychology between men and women which are different. I mean, it comes out in communication also. 
there's a basic difference in the psychology of men and women, which is indigenous to the gender. And it also comes out in speech and in conversation. And you'll see that. You know. When men talk, they usually go right to the subject matter. When women talk, they connect the subject matter with 10 other subject matters. <laughs> Mars, like like that book called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. <laughs> I never read Very it. complicated. <laughs> and if you're if you're instructing a woman, don't tell her what to do because that's not the answer to her question. <laughs> of course, devotees are a little bit beyond that. But yeah, there's a difference in in nature and different than nature also comes out generally in in communications also. But that's all right if you if you recognize that, and then you can and then you can, then you know how to respond. So it becomes more natural after a while. Thank you, Maharaj. Namrata, go ahead with your question. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Raj Prabhu, are, are you done with your question, Prabhu? Yes, thank you very oh, much. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Namrata, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your holy feet, all glories to the wonderful devotees present. Um, so, Guru Maharaj, I think oh, you almost answered the question, but um, there is a thin line uh, when you are talking firm and when you're talking, I mean, when you're angry and you're talking. So uh, how to, uh, you know, uh, discriminate that line uh, in our speech and how to recognize that when some other person is talking? So many times there's a misunderstanding. Even if somebody is talking firmly, they they misunderstand that you know uh, you you are getting angry. But that's not anger. That that's a firm statement sometimes, and people telling you firmly. Mm -hmm. You're writing. People are writing books about that now. You'll find the books even in devotee circles is the psychology of our anarthas. What do you know what is the anartha and what is the psychology of behind it and how how to overcome the negative aspects of that psychology and bring it to Krishna consciousness or at least bring it to the mode of goodness. I think Marsh uh, uh, that in the devotee circle they call that nonviolent communication, right, Marsh? That yeah. seemed to be the lingo. We have devotees who are working at that. There's Gore Gopal, he's really good at that. And he just finished his second book called uh, Energize Your Mind. And we just were with Sukhavaha, my god sister. She's written two books on the false ego. So these are opportunities to go into the intricacies of some of the uh, dynamics of relationships and how these things play out. It's the hardest thing in Kali Yuga to communicate that it is pleasing and beneficial. So, if one is thoughtful in, re in their words, it becomes easier. Mm -hmm. Like today, I met one of my god sisters. And, uh, you know, 
we had a few exchanges and she started immediately she started to praise me saying certain things about me and then i was just dumbfounded i didn't know what to say <laughs> um and you kind of get like tongue-tied when that happens and uh, you don't want to sound falsely humble by saying you know by just downplaying yourself so much or you don't want to somehow or other sit there and listen to it and then you start believing it <laughs> so yeah that's uh, so um so everything should be done with with the utmost care even if you do praise someone it's done in the right way if you want to correct someone, there is a way to correct someone without burning them out. Uh, there's in the book of Vaishnav etiquette, there's a section called correcting others. That was done by Bhakti Charu Swami Maharaj. How to correct others in the, in the way that is beneficial. That's not easy, but the tone of your voice has a lot to do with the, the effect of your speech. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think um, it, it, it helps me. I, I mean, it, it uh, recollects that I have to work a lot on myself. Uh, Thank you. Uh, there's one more related question in that, that in, uh, especially in India, the surrounding of uh, people are really, I can say in, in, um, in general, they are hyper sort of people. I mean, that is, that is very common. They're, they're high energy. Yeah, high energy, I can say in, in a good, in a soft language. So, um, the children are used to this thing right from the childhood. And when, uh, you know, uh, among these uh, soft-spoken person, uh, I mean, soft-spoken child comes, or, I mean, who is in the mode of, actually in the mode of goodness, then that is, um, he feels like an odd man out. I mean, he is actually right, but then he's forced to change his nature that, oh, you, you cannot take this much, you, you're weak. I mean, that's that. Uh, how can we work? I mean, how can we explain that child? No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, people around you are forcing you for wrong things. What are you trying to? What are you trying to communicate? Okay. Uh, so, uh, since in India there are high energy people around. Uh, children who are sometimes, uh, you know, not so much in the, in, in, I mean, I, I can say in the mode of goodness, they don't uh, communicate with such high energy. They are sometimes forced to take this kind of thing. And they're like, oh, you're not even uh, able to take uh, such, uh, you know, such words or such strong words. They're forced to accept those, th uh, those things. When, uh, that should not be the thing, right? Well, in dealing with a child, you have to understand who, what is your relationship with the child first. Your parent, that's one thing. A relative, that's another thing. If you're a person who is a friend of the family, that's another thing. And, will you know, respond a relationship a lot of times the parents have to discipline the child guide the child correct the child encourage the child so whatever the parents do is good and it's for the benefit of the child other people may not know what's good for the child
That's why subjecting children to the wrong association is very bad. There was this little kid in the temple today. He was dancing in kirtan. One devotee, Brahmachari, was lifting him up. And, and then at the end, when I was talking after my class, he came running over, running around, and then, and then he just ran away. <laughs> so, so. I was thinking, yeah, he, he's having a good time. It says when you're, when it, for a parent, when the child is, is from birth to five years old, the parent has to be very, very lenient. Not chastising, not correcting so much, but guiding. Guiding in the right way. When the child is from six to 15, very strict. Very strict. Why? Because that's the formative age. That's when they pick up all of their habits. And from 15 onward, friend. That's, Ch that's Shastra. Thank you, Sometimes you see, you know, parents really get angry at their small children. They're two or three years old. That's not good. Not good for the child at all. Because mm -hmm. the child is following its nature. That's, it needs guidance and corrections. And that has to be done in a loving way at that age. Mm -hmm. When they get older, then it's done in a more direct and, and very strong way. To make a point. And when they get 15, then if you try to cheat, cheat, treat, treat them as a child, then they sort of distance you, themselves from you. So if you want to keep that relationship, it's more like you treat them as an adult, in other words. You speak in the logical and practical way when you do. You may also tell him what to do, but you, that's done in a more less parent or you're not playing the role of a parent, you're playing the role of the friend. So I think Anasuya can pretty much give some practical advice based on the, her own experiences. Thank you, Maharaj. I was going to ask you for your permission. I think, Namrata, what you were saying is that sometimes when a child is soft, it's, it's looked at it as negative, like they're too weak, right? I can, Chandamali Maharaj knows very well both my girls, one is day and one is night. And he has seen Vrinda since she was born. My first daughter, Manoharini, is as soft as she come. And people used to think, even my own parents thought that something is wrong with that girl, you know, probably she needs some psyche. I mean, seriously, they thought she was, you know, naive. But I always encouraged her that she's a special child of Krishna. And the Lord made her to be that way. I gave her strength. But I, I never made her to be crazy like me. <laughs> I never did. Because she that's her nature, you know. That's her nature. But I always gave her strength that she's not weak. She is, that's how Krishna made her. There's a purpose for her to be that way. And, you know, and I gave a lot of support. You know, I said, the world can say you're weak, but you're not weak. I gave a lot of encouragement, a lot of love, a lot of support. And uh, she's 25 and she's, I'm so glad she's soft-spoken because the other one is not. <laughs> Maharaj knows. My second child is like me. So just give them the support <laughs> that it's nothing wrong being different. <laughs> yeah, my first I, daughter. I, I used to also think in the wrong way that Brinda was something wrong. But it wasn't. It was just her soft nature. Mara, she's a replica of Pariksha. 
everybody says that in terms of nature she's a replica of Parikshit and and the second daughter like I was talking to to Ashrimati last week Mara she met both the girls at Dallas K50 and uh she, and I didn't tell her my kids were coming I just forgot I think is what it was and then she called me she, she says Mataji I think Parikshit gave birth to Vish uh, Vajakopi not you it's a clone she looks just like my husband and the <laughs> I said yes you got that right but the first girl is so much like her like her dad and now she is you know it's a blessing because if I had two two hyper kid in my house I think it would be dangerous for me no she has turned out to be very nice praise them love them give them assurance there's nothing wrong to be soft-spoken there's nothing wrong to be gentle there's nothing wrong to be low you know, not high energy they let them know that krishna made them that way and there is service for them even in that energy the vishaka she's um she's intelligent and but she's very sensitive yes maharaj she is <laughs> and she can she can turn off quickly and she can turn on quickly <laughs> yes Maharaj. yes very different both of them the lord has taught me uh still teaching me how to deal with them in fact um you know like Marat said even when my first daughter was young people thought you know she's too quiet is she a misfit someone thought that she was a misfit really but somehow i always tell her you don't have to have the whole world to be your best friend one is enough to have more than one is a headache. So I gave a lot of assurance. And now she is great. Krishna's mercy by the mercy of a spiritual master. It's nothing wrong being soft spoken. It's actually a blessing. <laughs> no, it's actually a good quality. Yeah. I hope that helped, Namrata. Yes, it quite. I mean, it, it very much helps. Thank you very much because uh, my son is like that. And yes, and uh, I I many times try to tell that same thing that it's the special quality what Krishna has given you. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Iliana Mataji, go ahead. Iliana. How you spell your, say your name? Elena? Elena. Hare Krishna. Uh, accept, my, <laughs> accept my humble obeisances. Uh, um, all glories to Guru Maharaj, all glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to all devas. And um, yes, my, my name is. Buongiorno is simple. My name is Ilenia. 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 Yes. <laughs> um, you, you uh, Maraj, you explain uh, very all, all. You explain all. Uh, uh, important point for me is uh, communication um, in a Krishna consciousness. Because uh, um, uh, the um, arrive um, the message arrive very uh, very strong uh, uh, maybe and uh, it's important to have a right mood uh, in a right time in a, with the particular person. Um, and this is not uh, me or uh, or the other people, but Krishna uh, uh, is uh, in, inside uh, the the heart, uh, um, in, nel cuore delle persone, the devotees. Okay, non so se uh, Krishna uh, speak. Uh, in, through the heart and uh, uh, when uh, for example in my little experience uh, when uh, when uh, I, um, I stay with uh, the children um, child uh, 
with the child is not important uh, uh, the words uh, is important uh, your your energy and uh, your heart because uh, the, the child uh, see see very, very well um, uh, cause, cause I, cause I say to where you are what you are yeah, 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 correct, correct. That is true. Uh, the energy you carry, they pick up. Mm -hmm. And mm, that's true. That's true, not only with children, but all situations. Also with animals, too. Animals have a tendency to be fearful of humans and they run. But you can be around animals if your mind is peaceful and your energy is good. They won't run away from you or feel even fearful for you. They pick up on your energy more, even more than humans do. Because that's how they live, by energy. So children also. So become uh, Krishna energized. <laughs> Be energized with Krishna. And just think of Krishna. Try to reflect the words of Krishna. Try to reflect the mood of a devotee, which is the mood of service. <laughs> Grazie. <laughs> Grazie. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Very nice question. Very nice sharing, too. Thank you, Mataji. Yes, Prikshit, go ahead. And then I'll jump to Dear Krishna's question. Hare Krishna. <clears throat> Hare Krishna, Gunde. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to you, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Very nice discussion. I was just sitting back and hearing everything about my family and all of that. And um, the energy you talked about, how people pick up, you know, the energy. And even you talked about animals, they live the way they do based on energy. And when you were talking, then my own formal background, Christian background, kicked in because they are saying, that the Christians should fear God. They should fear God. Now, the energy of fear is, to me, an energy that does not connect with love so much. So if we meet somebody that is very, very much you know, Christian in thought, and they're thinking that you have to fear God, and we are talking about Krishna Prima, how to get to you know the loving relationship with the Lord. What are some of the practical ways to change a person who thinks that fearing God is the best you know, being taught that way to essentially stopping fearing God? Yeah. When, when Krishna showed Arjuna the universal form, he wanted Krishna to take it away because it's the fearful aspect of the Supreme. And so he, want, he only knew Krishna in that friendly aspect. So fear, as Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains, there's four, four levels or four mood, moods for worshiping the Lord. From the lowest to the highest, fear is the lowest. It's used for those who disobey the Lord in order for them to come back to obeying the Lord. The fear aspect is, is promulgated. And that way, if they think, oh, if I do something wrong, something bad is going to happen. So that fear aspect is generally for those who are deviant. 
And you also use that sometimes with children because it helps them avoid doing the wrong thing. But Bhakti Vinod Thakur says some people approach the Lord and worship the Lord from the prospect that if, and if I don't follow the instructions of the Lord, the Lord will make my life difficult. And that's the fear aspect. And that's prominent in other religions too. Christianity, Islam, Islam is very big on that. But it's basically for those who don't have much understanding of God or don't know how to act. And Bhakti Vinod course says then people worship God from the perspective that God is the punisher. Higher than that is to worship God because if I do, I'll be happy. So those who approach God, well, if I become God conscious or I become, you know, spiritually, I'll, I'll be happy. That's a little better, but the first two are still motivated motivated by personal interest. Because a person who worships the Lord to become happy might find themselves in a situation where they're not going to be happy or they even project the fact that they won't be happy. Therefore, they will, they will decrease in their worship or even stop their worship because it's not bringing me happiness. That's a little higher than the fear aspect. Bhakti Vinod Thakur takes it to the third level that we worship the Lord out of duty. It is my duty to worship the Lord. That therefore I am the Lord's servant and therefore it is a servant. It is the servant's duty to worship the master. So I perform my duty to the Lord because I am his servant. And therefore, our duty kind of situates one on a steady platform of devotion. And even if the duty is difficult, it doesn't matter. Because it's my duty. I accept these difficulties because that's my position to worship the Lord or serve the Lord. And the highest and most relishable platform is I worship the Lord out of love. And that's the perfection. One is motivated out of love for the Lord, and therefore that's their motivation for worship. So the fear aspect is the lowest. It's, it's more of a way to get people who are not up to the standard, who are deviant, who uh, see the Lord as their order supplier rather than their order giver. So getting him, we don't really try to interfere with that, you know. But we know from our practice of Krishna consciousness, it's the lowest form of motivation, fear. But if that's what it takes for them, then that's fine. Because the idea is if you destroy someone's motivation without bringing them to a, a higher motivation, and then they will become atheists, agnostics. Just like Prabhupada makes the example how during the war, in World War II in Germany, the, the wives, the husbands, the sisters were praying to God please bring my father back, bring my brother back, bring my son back. And they weren't coming back. So they were praying for something material. And when that didn't happen, they gave up God because they expected God to be their supplier of their own. I give you my prayer and you give the response according to my prayer. But that's, you know, that's like, that's, that's business. 
the guy, oh, the, guy, the Lord is there as a shopkeeper. You go into a shop, you give the money, and the shopkeeper gives you the item you want. What is your relationship with the shopkeeper? And he just provides what you need, but because you give him money. So prayer is offered, and therefore the Lord should respond to my prayer. It's like business. Mm -hmm. Same thing. But a devotee is motivated by duty. And that, if you stay on the duty platform, you will eventually come to the loving platform. Because through serving the Lord, one will actually start to become attracted to the Lord. And as attraction increases, attachment increases. And then when one, one becomes fully attracted to the Lord, one starts developing a love, love for the Lord or affection for the Lord. As affection develops, then it, it eventually accommodates in loving relationship. So I would give people advice who are in that mood, but you don't have to accept that mood for your own personal so what we, you know, they, their conception of God is the all-powerful lawgiver. Our conception of God is a beautiful boy of Vrindavan who plays on this flute and has many girlfriends. And, and he's always having fun. <laughs> and anyone who comes in contact with him is also having fun. Fun. <laughs> Thank you, Marge. Um yeah, I need no terms. So the lowest is fear. That's the lowest form. And then you talked about uh from fear, a little higher is those who wish of God just to bring happiness to them, but it's material happiness they want. If they don't get it, then they might not even want to continue. Then the higher is serve the Lord out of duty, which is where the body starts. And then from there, uh, serving out of love. And the duty can eventually come to the stage of loving Supreme Personality yeah. of God. A person will Thank reject you very much. A, uh, a certain person, a person may reject a service offered because they think it's not going to make me happy. Mm -hmm. oh. But the body doesn't care about happiness. That's... Thank you, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Maharaj, there's a question here by Dear Krishna. Um, Hare Krishna, Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Shri Prabhupada. All glories to you. Great discussion. What should we do so that our nature yeah. being... Uh, oh, wait. I have issue with this. Okay. Yeah. What should we do so that our nature being too soft or too aggressive does not come in between our services and dealing with devotees how can we make ourselves aware of our nature if it is an obstacle to ha to handling our service and dealings with devotees how yes yes um wow well, mm -hmm. you um you kind of evaluate and yourself from based on the experiences you're having as you interact with others you can see maybe i'm being, being too aggressive i'm being not uh, because i'm too soft i've not been able to actually communicate what i really want to communicate so you have to kind of like see what what's happening by the response to the other I hope it, that helped. I'm sorry, Marge. Trial and error. You pull back or you increase according to what. And then, you, you know, you have to also see the person who is there. That's another thing. If you're with a very uh, introverted person, you may not say also so many things. 
if you're a person who is more outgoing and talkative, you may say more things. I hope that helped, Dr. Krishna. Yeah, a devotee can also be somewhat multi-personality. He can learn how to deal with different types of people in different situations and still not lose his center as a, as a person. Now, like, I'm like this, therefore I can't communicate in this situation. And then, Sometimes we have to be flexible to who we're with. Margie said, I just love that answer. It's so practical that I should become aware based on the response I get to my behavior. Thank you, Maharaj. That's what he said. And uh, Raj Prabhu, please go ahead with your question. Thank okay. you. Uh, the really relishing today's conversations because uh, I used to find so many times that when I was having a conversation with someone before I even opened my mouth I would get a response and there's so many times sometimes it was a bad response sometimes it was a good and I was always mystified by it but now I'm thinking that's all because of the energy and that's like the energy is actually a major part in this communications because some people like I'm so in some situations I may be angry, but I may have kept it to myself. I say, like, I'm not going to say a word, I'm not going to say a word. But they picked up on it and they've responded and retaliated with it. In other cases, like my energy has been like very welcoming, and then they're like becoming like uh so nice to me. And I'm like, thinking, what's going on here? Why? And then obviously go so going back to our our previous discussion about soft speech and I wrote so many points about that were raised in those conversations so is the energy actually a huge part in this whole communication process is it even the key part yeah yeah it's the key part the intention of what you're trying to say is also a reflection of the energy you're giving out what are you trying to do? You're trying to get someone to do something? You're trying to give something to someone? You're trying to make a point? What is, what is that? What are you trying to do? And the energy you're doing it with will be will be reflective of how that point is accepted or not accepted. Sometimes when I when I heard the beginning of your question. I was thinking people didn't want you to say anything, so they were saying things ahead of time, keep you quiet. <laughs> so you, you know, maybe there's some previous experience with that person, and then they're reacting like that. You know, or maybe it's just that person. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's very helpful. That's answered a lot of uh, things that have been puzzling me previously. Thank you very much. Yeah, I thought the note that core kind of gives a little summary of relationships. He says, I get along with everyone because I, re I give everyone respect. You keep that foremost, and then the conversations will be secondary to how to how the, the responses are given. If they can feel that you, you appreciate them and respect them, then immediately communications will open up. Yes, Marge. it has to be done with sincerity. I feel some people, sometimes they're like treating you respectfully, but it feels false. Like today, I had an incident where I walked out of my room to get something done. I wanted to get, and someone, some special guest was just there. Someone that I, I know very well, and he's actually a great spiritual person. But I didn't expect that. And I had to drop my whole mood of trying to get my thing done that I came out of my room for. And then all of a sudden, I was in a conversation with that person. 
So, you know, if I would have ignored that person just to get my thing done, that would have been kind of quite rude. Mm -hmm. The other person might think, well, Maharaj is busy and therefore, um, you know, maybe it's not the right time. Or they could have thought, you know, Maharaj just doesn't want to talk to me. <laughs> but I talked to them and that was the best thing I could do. Greeted them and was happy to see them. So, so you know, you, you see, there's so many dynamics to situations. You're feeling bad and then you run into somebody and they don't help you in that feeling <laughs> and you just you go on in the same mood. To be thoughtful is important because then you can survey some of the possible ways you can respond to whatever is given. But be friendly. That's the point. Krishna says that in the Gita. So he mentions that. Uh, go to that verse, 12th chapter Bhagavad Gita. Okay, Maharaj. 12th chapter. There's only 20 verses in the chapter. Go to verse, I think, 18. Okay. It's the end of yeah, it's really worth exploring these verses. Bhagavad Gita. There we go, Marge. 1218. Uh, go down the page. One who is equal to friends and enemies, who is equipoise in honor and dishonor, heat and cold, happiness and distress, fame, who is always free from contamination always silent and satisfied with anything, who does not care for any residence, who is fixed in knowledge, who is engaged in devotional service, such a person is very, very dear to me. Go to the next verse. Here's some of the qualities of a devotee here. Yeah. Um, those who follow him completely engaged in framework very dear to me. Um, go back to some of the earlier verses, maybe around 16, 17. Let's see. These verses remind me of Jankinat Prabhu. Yeah. Yeah, you go down the page, we can read the verse ahead of time. Yeah, let's see. Whoop. He who puts no one in difficulty was not disturbed by anyone who is equipoised. He's very dear to me. One who is not envious, but a friend to all of them, who does not think himself a proprietor. He is his own. My devotee is not dependent on the ordinary course of, course of activities. He is pure expert without cares, free from all pains. Very dear to me. One who is equal to friends and enemies. And these are all... Yeah, one who becomes a friend to others, and who is friendly to others also. I think some of the even earlier verses are even mentioned there. Let's see what we got, 14, 12, let's see. Yeah, yeah well, okay, yeah, it starts with 13. Yeah, one who's not envious, but is a friend to a living entity. That's a very important one. Friend means they always think of the welfare of others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for going into that in depth, Maharaj. Yeah, these are some things. Also, I'm getting a little on in time here. 
Yes, Marge. I, I would like to ask you, Marge, would you like to end with a round of chanting? Or if you have something to do, that's also fine, Marge. Perfect. <laughs> we'll have two rounds to go. Okay. Okay. I'm ready for that one. Thank you. I don't want to sound selfish, but you hit, you push the right button. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Marge. <laughs> <laughs>